We are certainly a blessed people. We have a God in heaven who, in His wisdom, created us, who made us in His own image, who gave us a breath of life and created in us an eternal part that He desires to have an everlasting relationship with. And it's awesome to consider the love and the mercy of such a powerful and creative being. And as we think about all the blessings that God has given to us, He instilled in us a heart and a desire to know more about Him. And that's what we have endeavored to do throughout this series of meetings. God does not want to remain a mystery. God wants to be revealed to us. And in His Word, we can study and read and meditate upon things that give us a great amount of insight concerning who God is. And in that insight, also learn about who we are as His creation. And we focused around this idea of Proverbs 15 and verse 14, that the heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. And this morning, I hope and pray that you desire to be wise concerning God, that you uh, desire to be wise concerning that which is good and to know the will of God in your life so that you can make the necessary changes and implement the things that God is telling us to do so that we can glorify Him and receive all the blessings and benefits that He's promised to deliver to us. God is faithful. God is good. And God has made wonderful promises to us. And some of those promises we're enjoying today. That we have the salvation and the forgiveness of our sins by the death that we've just remembered this morning by partaking of His body and His blood. That we have the confidence and the boldness that we can communicate with God as a loving Father in heaven through Jesus Christ and we know He hears our prayers. We have the support and the love of like-minded individuals within the body of Christ who are there to encourage and help us to keep going at times where we may feel discouraged and down about our faith. We can lay our head on our pillow at night and we can be at peace with our Creator. We're blessed, aren't we? We have a place that's been reserved for us to enjoy the eternity of rest and worship that God wants us to have in a place called heaven that we can look forward to, that can drive and motivate us to continue living and being faithful and seeking and learning and growing until the day that this life ends. We're a blessed people. But Jesus said that to whom much is given, much shall be required. You know, those blessings that God freely gives to us as His children also come with a great amount of responsibility. And any time we see a blessing of God, we ought to also see an accountability to Him for using what He's given to us to bring honor and glory to His name. And this morning we're going to discuss the desire that we need to have to know more about our worship and our service in the church. And I'm not talking about collectively as just a congregation, but I'm talking to you as an individual member of the body of Christ. That you have been given great promises and God is faithful and is delivering those to you and you're walking in them and you're seeing the benefits of serving God here in this life. You need to understand God has some expectations that He's placed upon you and I as we walk and we live and we bask in the glory of all of His love and His mercy. And for us to deny the fact that there are responsibilities would be foolish. For the wise man understands that any time I receive something, guess what? It comes with an expectation of God. Now Jesus was a free gift to humanity. And His sacrifice on the cross was a free gift of grace that God extended down to us. But even that gift, for us to receive the benefits of that gift, being eternal life and the forgiveness of sins, there are expectations or conditions that God placed upon our ability to receive that gift. The offering of the gift was unconditional, and He did that. But for that gift to truly have an impact on your life, there are expectations that God has upon you. One of those being that you would hear and understand the gospel message of Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. That you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and there would be no doubt in your heart or your mind about who He is. That you would be willing to repent and change from the sinful mindset of this world and turn your heart to God and begin to seek His will and to walk and to do what He's asked you to do. 
You would confess Him before men and make that proclamation that you believe Jesus is the Son of God and that you would be willing to be buried with Him in baptism. Coming in contact with His death and arising out of that watery grave to walk in the newness of life. You see, Jesus was a free offering, but there are conditions upon you receiving the benefits of that offering. You know, the same is true in the church today. And I want you to think about, you recognize that building there, don't you? It's the very building that we are sitting in this morning as we worship God together. And the church certainly is more than a building, and it doesn't matter what type of building we're meeting in. The church is those who have been called out, brothers and sisters in Christ, who have taken part in that death of Christ and have a common bond of unity with one another through the shed blood of Jesus. Does this church mean anything to you? Does this congregation matter to you? Or is it just another building that you come to time time to learn something good that then you can selfishly take away? Or are you here this morning at this, this building with a heart that says, you know what? I want to be a servant of God. And because I want to be a servant of God, He has given me responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities is I'm here to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ. As Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 15, he wrote to him talking about if he was delayed in his coming to Timothy, that he wanted Timothy to know what, was, what were the expectations of God placed upon him as an evangelist, a worker in the kingdom. And he said, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. There were expectations placed upon Timothy by the Apostle Paul who is inspired of the Holy Spirit that these are things God expects you to do in the church. There are things that are right. There are things that are wrong. And God's expectations I'm declaring to you. He says, maybe I can't be there with you, but I want you to fully comprehend and understand what the expectations are expectations are clearly defined and communicated effectively, everyone knows and everyone can be on the same page. You know, we get into a lot of conflict when we don't understand expectations. Husbands and wives have a lot of conflict when there are unmet expectations and sometimes they're unmet because people haven't communicated, this is what I expect or this is what I desire. God has clearly given us the expectations for His kingdom and for His church. And this morning, I want to remind you of some of those things. Some of these things you may have heard a number of times sometime, or some of you may not have ever heard these things. But I want you to understand that God has expectations, and oftentimes we don't meet those expectations because of a problem that is known as apathy. You know what apathy is? It's a lack of desire and a lack of care. And we think of situations where people have become apathetic, they tend to get lazy. And they give proper attention, proper energy to the things that are most important. And we would say they became apathetic toward those things. And we see a decline in the effectiveness of those individuals serving in those positions or receiving those blessings and benefits. And what apathy ultimately causes is no interest, no commitment, which then leads to really no true discipleship. We're not here this morning to try to fill a building. We're here this morning to train and teach people to become disciples of Jesus Christ. There's a huge difference. We can fill buildings, but our desire is that we truly be disciples. And that means there has to be a commitment that not just a part of your heart is committed to, but it overwhelms your entire being. And you say, more than anything in this life, I want to serve God. You know, God's people in the Old Testament had a problem with this. God blessed them, didn't He? God had delivered them the promised land. God had caused them to become very prosperous. They were mighty in wars, and they were very successful in a worldly sense. And oftentimes when they were blessed by God in that way, guess what they forgot? They forgot to glorify God. And as they forgot to glorify God, God would send and ultimately remind them through some type of suffering or punishment or we would call chastisement, disciplining them, to remind them, hey, where'd you get all that land? Where did you get all that treasure? Where did you get the power to win that war? Don't forget who I am. And they would repent and they would turn back to God and we see this circular problem 
over and over throughout the history of the children of Israel. In Malachi chapter 1, we see where the apathetic heart and attitude had gotten the nation. And by this time, God honestly had kind of reached the point that He was done with Israel. And I want you to look at what was indicative of their apathetic heart toward God. Malachi 1 in verse 6 says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, and what have we despised your name? You offer to file food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? You see, what had happened in Israel is they had gotten to a point with God where they had no longer reverence or respect for Him. And guess what they continued to do? They offered sacrifices, didn't they? But it was, when it came time to offer sacrifices, what did they bring? He said, you bring defiled food to my altar. They knew what they were told to bring. They knew what the command of God was. And they said, God will accept whatever I want to give to Him. Instead of bringing the first of their flocks, guess what they started to do? Well, here's a lame member of my flock that's no good or no use to me. I'll take that and offer it to God and it'll be good enough. Or here's the blind or the sick and I'll offer it to God because it's of no use to me because if it was of use to me, I wouldn't be willing to sacrifice it to God. That's where they had come in their life with God. That's how they viewed God. They didn't respect Him, didn't reverence Him. And too often we see the same heart and the same attitude today in the Lord's kingdom. Apathy destroys. Apathy breeds laziness. And apathy creates an environment where we begin to think, God will accept anything that I want to give Him and I feel good about what I offer. The nation felt good about bringing these things to the altar of God and saying, we're making a sacrifice. God, look at how great we are. And God said, look at what you're doing. He said, you offer it this type of sacrifice to, to those who are your secular authorities, would they be happy with that? Much less offering it to the one true and living God. It's foolish, isn't it? To think that God would be pleased with that, but they had become so apathetic in their mind toward God that that's exactly what was happening. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 18 says, Because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. Proverbs 18 and verse 9 says, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. You see, when you don't care about the things of God, you're going to get lazy. And you're going to stop giving attention to the things that really require a lot of attention to be maintained. I'll tell you, this is a beautiful building that we're in. You know, in the matter of two or three days, we could bring equipment out here, and we could bring a wrecking ball, and we could bring dozers, and guess what we could do to this building? We could tear it down, couldn't we? Back home, we had a building, a big structure in Jacksonville, Texas, that we drove by every day, and I didn't drive by there for about three or four days, and I drove by there and said, what in the world? It wasn't there anymore. They had torn it down and raised it and the ground was just bare and there was nothing. You wouldn't even have known anything had ever been there. I want to tell you that's one way to destroy a building. But you know another way? is to stop doing the necessary maintenance upon it and just let it sit. Because if you let it sit for long enough, guess what? It just decays. If you don't take care of the things that you know could go wrong and you don't maintain the things that need attention from time to time, guess what? That building decays and eventually it'll fall apart. And so often is that indicative of our Christian life. Not because we sit there one day and say, I'm rebelling against God and I hate Him. We just stop giving attention to the things that really require a lot of attention for us to successfully serve God. And we become lazy. 
And laziness leads to destruction. You know what apathy looks like? 50% less. You say, what do you mean? I want you to think about your typical Sunday morning crowd at a worship assembly. You know what apathy looks like? What you get on Wednesday nights. What you get on Sunday nights. Because everybody wants to be there Sunday morning. Why? Well, we love God. We want to worship Him. But then Sunday night comes and, well, got other things to do. Or sometimes people say, it doesn't tell me I have to meet twice on Sunday. You're right. But I want to tell you, if that's your argument, there's a problem with the heart. Because there's nothing about the Word of God that we're simply looking for a list of commands that we can check off of a list and glorify Him. We're looking for a heart that changes, that says more than anything, I want to serve God. And if we're going to worship on Sunday afternoon, my heart says that's where I want to be and that's what I want to do and I'm going to make effort and do what's necessary for me to be there and be a part. You know, churches, if they get 50% of their crowd, they consider that a success for a midweek or a Sunday night service. That should disappoint us. Because I want to tell you what 50% less is. It's apathy. It's you saying, it's not important to me, and I don't have to do that. And I want to tell you, that's a sign that you've become apathetic toward God. Now, coming to a worship assembly is not the entirety of your service to God. I understand that. But I do believe that's one area that's very easy for us to identify as if we're willing to truly serve God or not. And it's tangible and it's recognizable and we can kind of measure that. Hebrews 10 and verse 24 is let let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That's why we assemble. That's why we worship. I promise this congregation, its leadership doesn't say let's have a midweek service so people will feel guilty about not coming. They have a midweek service because, hey, let's get together and let's stir each other up unto good works and let's provoke one another to love and let's keep ourselves motivated to go out and be in the world the rest of the week and be the lights and the salt and the example and the disciples that God has called us to be. But as long as we look at it as a checklist that I just come and do my duty and I go about my life, I want to tell you, you're missing out on the greatest blessings of God and your heart truly is not converted to Christ. And this morning, I think it's great that you're here sitting on a pew. But you know what we want more than that? We want your heart to be turned to God. We want you to be a seeking disciple of Jesus Christ who wants to grow and learn, and for that to happen, you can't be apathetic toward Him. Here are some questions I want you to consider about your life and your walk with Christ. And these are real life examples of things that that we participate in and do. How many home Bible studies have you have been hosted by members? How many Bible studies have you arranged for friends or family? How many people have you encouraged to visit this congregation? How many visits have you made to the hospital? How many visits have you made to the prison? How many fellowship opportunities have you attended? How many ministry opportunities have you participated in? How many meals have you provided for others? How many times have you opened your home and shared with others? How many times have you spoken of Jesus with those around you? How many? I can look at it and say, well, I know Brother Craig has done that. Well, I guess that can count for me too. It doesn't work that way, does it? This is your responsibility as a, as a disciple of Christ to do these things. And when these things are left undone in your life, you suffer. And I have conversation after conversation after conversation with people who just want to know what to do. And I sit there and say, do these things. Oh, I can't do that. (laughs) You can do anything you want to do. Find something to do that glorifies God and do it to the best of your ability. Be engaged, be a part, participate, support, encourage. All the things that the church needs. 
And if we all truly did that, how powerful and strong would our congregations be? How encouraging would it be to be with our family on the first day of the week and on Sunday evenings and Wednesday nights and Saturday evening with fellowship opportunities and all the things that the church tries to do. They don't do those things just to fill a calendar. Those things are purposed and purposeful. Because apathy often looks like this in our congregations. Oh, that's kind of funny, isn't it? We got individuals back here on electronic devices. I'm sure she's reading her Bible diligently. And she has her eSword app opened up and she's studying what's being taught. I'm sure that's the case. She's not on Facebook or Twitter or anything else. When is the sermon going to end? When is he going to sit down? I'm tired. I don't want to hear this. Not even trying. Distracted. Asleep on the front pew. Is that you this morning? I see one gentleman, he's trying to encourage him. Come on, man, wake up. Wake up. I know it can be hard, but is that what our churches look like? I'll tell you, I've been blessed to preach at a lot lot of congregations. As you stand up at a crowd of people, guess what you see sometimes? You see this very thing. You know why? Because we're apathetic. We think we've done our duty when we've come and sat on a pew. We can nap, we can be distracted, we don't have to really pay attention. We just go through the motions and, hey, we glorified God. And when we do that, we've left undone some of the most important things that God has asked us to do when we assemble. Micah 6 and verse 6 says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You know, sometimes we think if God would require some great thing for us to just do and show Him, I can do that. Would He be satisfied if I could make all these sacrifices? Would He be satisfied? And you know what God's saying? He's saying those aren't the things that are important. What's important is your heart. He says, I want you to do right. I want you to be good. I want you to be just and objective and make good choices and decisions in your life to love mercy to be forgiving, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what He desires. And too often we get caught up in the checklist of of the things that we do and say, well, I've served God, and God's sitting there the whole time saying, you haven't done anything for me because your heart's not right. Because apathy breeds laziness, and laziness breeds destruction. And we want a shortcut. I'll tell you, there's no shortcut to being a successful Christian. It's hard work. And you have to be willing and dedicated to say, you know what, I'm willing to count the cost and be the disciple Christ calls me to be because we're fighting in a war. And too often times we kind of prepare people to go to war and they go out to war and to fight in this life and they come back and say, that other side is shooting at me. <laughs> why are they shooting at me? You know why? Because we're not properly trained and we're not truly counting the cost of what it means to go to war. If you're ready to go be a disciple and fight the spiritual war that we need to be engaged in, you're going to fully expect that fire to be returned to you. And you're going to be prepared and able that when those darts are hurled your way, God's Word will protect you. But sometimes we're too lazy to go fight, and we get discouraged when the other side attacks us. It's reality. Be prepared for it. But the apathetic church and the apathetic Christian is ill-prepared to handle the realities of life. I want you to consider our assembly this morning. And what happens when we become apathetic to any aspect of this worship that we offer to God? What if we're apathetic in our teaching? Now this is going to take some honesty, but has anyone ever gotten behind this pulpit... And as they're talking, you as an audience know they haven't prepared. They haven't studied. They threw something together. 
Or they got online and downloaded an outline and they're trying to preach someone else's material. You know why people do that? Because they don't care. If they cared, they would put the time in that's necessary to be a good student of the Word of God and be able to effectively teach His people. But we think throwing something together is good enough because we're filling our spot on the calendar. My name's there. I'm going to do it. And I do it. And I check it off my list. Do you understand as a teacher of God's people, you have a responsibility and you're going to give account to God? I understand that this morning, that everything I teach, I'm going to give account to God for. And that's, that's serious business. And we need to take our teaching seriously. And when you have the opportunity, I want to tell you, it's a blessing to teach. And when you have that opportunity, if you have that desire, when you do it, you get up and you do the best you can. Because you truly care and you're sincere in your dedication to teaching the Word of God to people who are hungering and desiring to be fed. That's how we have to look at our teaching. Jeremiah 23 and verse 29 describes the Word of God. And Jeremiah says, or the Lord tells Jeremiah, Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You know, there came a time where Jeremiah said, I can't keep going, I can't keep preaching. But in chapter 20, he says, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back and I could not. He said, I can't help but teach the word of God. God has given me this responsibility. He's holding me accountable for the gift that He's given to me and revealing His will for the nation of Israel to me. And I have to tell them, He was discouraged, He wept, He was depressed, He suffered. But at the end of the day, He got up and He went and delivered the message that needed to be delivered. Why? Because it wasn't about Him. It was about the power that was within the Word of God that people needed. That means as an audience, you can't be apathetic when the Word of God's being preached. Because I've sat in audiences and heard sermons that I knew they didn't prepare. But guess what I do as a student of God and one who desires to know more? At least I try to do. Guess what? I try to listen even harder. (laughs) Because at least they're going to read scriptures, typically, hopefully, And I can get something from that even if they haven't put the necessary time in to teach. And to be honest with you, if those are the type of guys we have in our pulpits, they need to sit down. And let men teach who have a desire and a passion for teaching and instructing God's people. Have you become apathetic as a teacher? If you have, regain the fire that was there at one time and be motivated to improve and get better so that you can properly and effectively instruct God's people. We read this passage earlier in one of our morning sessions about Nehemiah reading to the people, and all the people stood up. The audience was yearning and wanting to know more about God. There in verse 6 says, they lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads, worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. In verse 8, uh, the They read the book of the law of God distinctly. They gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That's why we teach. We're not here to go through the motions. I want to tell you, I don't get any glory just standing up and saying, you know what, I got to preach this morning. I want you to leave here with something that you can say, that's going to help me. That's going to make me a stronger Christian and more dedicated to God. What about in our prayers? 1 Corinthians 14 of our 6 says, What is the conclusion of, of, of it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? Do we ever just go through the motions in our prayers? You know, we have a ritual or a practice in our home that before every meal... We try to be together and we say a prayer and we teach our children and they say a prayer. And you know what? For a while, guess what they learn? They learn the same repetitive prayer. That's fine when they're five and six, but as they get older, guess what we need to teach them to do? Hey, be open with God. Just just tell Him what's truly on your heart at that moment. You don't have to go through a checklist of, you know, every we're praying for the food and we're praying for those who are sick and traveling. That's fine if that's really on your heart, but... We don't have to do that. Is there something else you're thinking about right now that's bothering you that you want to lay before God, be thankful to Him? Just pray and communicate with Him. Jesus said, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. 
Because the vain repetitions are just rote, memorized prayers that we've all heard. And we all fall into that, I understand, but God's seeking more. He wants a heart that's willing to be truly open and transparent and say, God, you know me. And God, I know myself. And God, I'm willing to open my heart and my mouth to you and acknowledge the things I need help with and I need to work on. And certainly I want to praise and bless you as my creator. And our prayers ought to be indicative of an attitude that truly wants to serve God. What about our singing? Now, it's hard to say the singing around here is apathetic because you guys have a congregation of people who love to sing. And you're blessed in that. But I want to tell you, I've been in congregations where can we only sing one song? You know, our singing doesn't sound that great, and we just kind of want to get it over with. And I'll tell you, we'd become apathetic if that's our heart and attitude toward praising God. God gave you a voice. God wants to hear you sing because He knows that's worship that comes from your heart, regardless of the note that leaves your lips. Ephesians 5 and 19 says, Speaking to one of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again in Colossians 3 and verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, there's going to come a time where your voice weakens. Back home in Gallatin, we had a dear sister in Christ that passed away a few years ago. And you know, one of her favorite things to do was sing. And when we moved up there 15 years ago, she was already old. But she sat in a pew, a few rows behind us at church. And when she was there and she was on her game, I heard that alto of Sister Jonelle. I want to tell you, that encouraged me. Because I knew as easy as it was for me to get up that morning and to get dressed and get to church, it wasn't quite that easy for Sister Jonelle at 82 years old. But she did it. That woman was on her deathbed. And as I would go and see her and visit with her, and her mind began to fade and her body began to fail... She said, you know what I miss most about church? She said, I love your sermons. They're good. (laughs) Sometimes. She said, I love seeing everybody. She said, I love singing. I miss the singing. I miss praising God. And So we took a group from church over to her house and we sang around her bed. And guess what she was trying to do with all her might? She was just trying to sing one little word. And her voice wasn't strong enough for anything to come out. But I want to tell you, God saw her heart. And I believe God saw the praise that she was giving him that day. We take it for granted. There's going to come a day where your voice fails. Will your heart still sing praises to God? Do you take... Our singing service for granted? Or are you truly convicted and convinced in the importance of opening your mouth and letting God hear your voice? See, if we're apathetic, our singing shows it. And we get lazy and we give it a lack of attention. What about communion? You know, one of the arguments that we often run into with people is, They find out we have the communion every first day of the week. and say, well, if you do it every week, it just doesn't mean as much. It just needs to be reserved for special times. And sometimes we prove their argument right. When we get up here and say, well, we have the bread, we have the fruit of the vine. Let's remember Jesus. Let's pray. We feed into that argument because we're apathetic toward it. Yes, we do it. But we're not giving it the attention that it really needs to be effective. I appreciate Brother Jerry's comments this morning of reminding us of the suffering of our Savior and looking at prophecy and looking at the description of what was going to happen to Jesus and His willingness to step up and be that substitute for us. And painting that picture of Barabbas and Jesus being there and we're Barabbas, we understand that. That's beautiful to think about and we couldn't help but have our minds focused on what we were doing, hopefully. But when we're lazy about it, it just becomes something else that we do. And we feed the argument that it doesn't mean as much. 
I'll tell you, this means as much to me today as it did 18, 19 years ago when I became a Christian. And next Sunday, if I'm blessed to be in an assembly of the Lord's body and we're partaking, it's going to mean just as much then as it does today. And I hope and pray that that's in your heart this morning. Luke 22 and verse 19 says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 speaks to the correction of the church at Corinth and what they were doing wrong in that assembly of taking part of the Lord's Supper. And he says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. But for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. He says, You have to do a self-examination. And as this bread and this fruit of the vine is passed to you, you have truly examine and think about your life and remember the great need that you have for Christ. And if you don't do that, you're missing an essential part of the purpose of why Jesus instituted this memorial. Quit going through the motions and feeling good about, yes, I glorify God, did what He told me to do, and make sure that you understand the importance and the implications of the deeper meaning of why we do what we do. And I've seen people in the church for years who never get to the point to where they really understand why we do what we do. And that's sad. Because as disciples, we ought to be well acquainted with why we do what we do. Now, how do we fix apathy? Number one, we remember the greatest command. The greatest command wasn't to come to church. The greatest command wasn't to have communion. The greatest command wasn't to sing or to teach or any of the things that we do in our assemblies. The greatest command was to love God. And if we'll get back to that, all the other things fall into place. And we won't be apathetic toward teaching or communion or prayers or singing when we truly love the Lord. Mark chapter... 29, Jesus answered him, the first of the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The greatest thing you can do in your life to be a servant of God and a disciple of Jesus is to love God. Desire Him. Want to know more about Him because you know He has the answers to life. And He sacrificed Himself for you. And we're indebted to love Him in return. Do you study to win an argument? Do you study to win a debate? Do you study to justify something that you've already chosen in your mind with this preconceived idea of what you want to believe and what you want to do? And I'm going to find verses that will support that. Or do you study with the intent of saying, God, mold me and make me into what I need to be? And as I'm reading and studying, I'm gaining insights, and the Holy Spirit's working within me, showing me the things I need to change. And once I'm aware of those changes, I make the changes. I don't sit there and look at myself and say, I need to change that, and then walk away and don't do anything about it. But I put in the work and I put forth the effort. Why? Because I'm not apathetic, because I care. I care about God. I care about His church. I care about Jesus. I care about the kingdom. I care about my soul. I care about the souls of my children and my wife. I care about the souls of men who are out there who don't know Jesus. That's a motivated disciple. And we're all motivated by the same thing, which is our love for God. That's the first step. You want to overcome apathy? Remember to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Secondly, rededicate, refocus, and return to God. There's a story in the Old Testament of King Josiah who began to reign at the age of eight, and he was a great restorer of God's people. Because under his reign, they had found the book of the law, and he caused that book of the law to be read to all the people, and all the people took a stand for the covenant. There in verse 3 it says, Then the Lord, the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep His commandments and His testimonies and His statutes with all His heart and all His soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. You see, all it took was one 
noble, dedicated king to inspire the entire nation to return to God. What if Josiah had been apathetic? Yeah, you found the book of the law, that's great. We all kind of know what that law says. Our fathers lived by it sometimes, didn't. And uh, Let's be careful because we don't want to offend people. So let's not really say what the law... The law let's, let's be gentle with it and be careful because we don't want to run people from the nation off. You know what Josiah said? He said, bring the book and let's read the book. And those who want to dedicate and refocus and do what this book tells us to do to please God, will do it. And if there are some in the nation that want to rebel and go a different way, I pray that you'll change your heart and you'll change your mind and you'll come back at some point, but God bless you. We're not going to change the message to suit you. We're to change our life to fit the message. And we have to start living that. And if you'll love God and you'll rededicate and you'll refocus and you'll return to God, guess what? Apathy goes away. Because you're driven, you're motivated, you're loving God, and you're wanting nothing more than to serve Him. You've got to be willing to leave everything behind. That's past failures, that's past successes. <laughs> that's sin, that's mindsets, that's thinking patterns. You've got to be willing to leave that in your past and embrace a future with God. As Jesus called His first disciples... Verse 11 of that chapter, as he's calling James and John, verse 11 says, So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. When Jesus said, Come follow me, those early disciples said, Where are we going? And they followed. And everywhere Jesus went, they went. Where the Word of God leads you, you need to go. When you read and study and it says to do this, leave everything in the past behind and just obey and have faith. I want to tell you, you won't be apathetic. Because you'll be loving God and you'll be motivated to serve Him. And finally this morning, I believe we need to get hot for Christ. We need to be passionate about our pursuit of God. You know, sometimes people mistake charisma for passion. I'm not saying you have to get up and jump up and down on the stage to show how hot you are for Christ and that you're motivated I want to tell you, there ought to be things in your life that are very clear to people around you of, of what your desires are. You know, we can tell what we're passionate about, can't we? Because that's what often defines us, and that's where we spend our time and our energy and our effort. And when you're passionate about a certain thing, it's going to immerse you, and it's going to take over your heart and your mind, and what happens is we choose very unhealthy things to dominate our life, and we become lukewarm or cold toward God. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, in writing to the church at Laodicea, he says, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's a disgusting picture. <laughs> but you know, God uses it. That's a strong description, isn't it? He said, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're just kind of in the middle. Now understand, he's writing to a congregation of the Lord's people. Guess what College Park Church of Christ is? It's a congregation of the Lord's people. What if he was addressing the College Park Church of Christ in this letter? What would he say about your congregation? I'm not a member of this congregation. We have a lot of family, loved ones, and dear friends in this congregation. But you know, you decide what this congregation is going to be by your life. Is this congregation truly on fire for Christ? Are you cold? I don't think anybody would look at it and say, no, they're just cold. They just don't care at all. <laughs> but are you hot? Is every member truly dedicated to everything that's going on here? Is everybody willing to be a part of the team and work together for this and really make a difference? Or are some people just kind of lackadaisical, go through the motions? And I'm kind of warm. 
I'm not cold. I love people. I care about people. But I'm not hot because <laughs> there's things they do that I just aren't for me. And we kind of stay in that middle ground. That's apathy. I want you to look as we close this morning at Psalm 139. And I don't have this up here on the screen, but, but I want to close with this idea. Psalm 139 and verse 23. David pleading with God. He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Have you ever welcomed any or that level or that type of scrutiny from God? David was pleading with God. He says, God, search me. <laughs> Examine my life and tell me if there's any wicked way in me and expose that so I can change and be who I need to be. Have you ever asked God to be that scrutinizing with you? There's risk in that. Because guess what God's going to see? Everything. And God sees us exactly how we are, and He looks into our heart, and He sees if there's an evil and wicked way. But David poured himself out before God and said, Search me. Reveal it in me. Show me. See, what happens to us is we start down a path with God. I want to tell you, one of my favorite drinks or beverages in the world is this lemon-lime sports drink. I don't know if I can say the name. But this lemon-lime sports drink pleases me. It tastes good. It's refreshing. And sometimes maybe we could equate this with God. God, I love you. God, I'm going to dedicate my life to you, and I want you to into me and fill me and, and satisfy and fulfill everything that I need in life. And we read our Bible, we study, and we drink from God. But you know, there's other beverages that I enjoy drinking. One of them is chocolate milk. I like chocolate milk. But you know, what this represents is our selfish ambition, our sin, and things in this life that would still want to draw us away from God. And sometimes, guess what? We drink from this world. Oh, but I come to church on Sunday and I want to drink from God. I want God to refresh. I want God to restore. But I like to smoke pot. Oh, I want to read and I want to study and I want to grow and I want to know God. And I drink from that. But you know what? I like to look at pornography. So I drink a little bit more from the world. and That's inconsistent, isn't it? And sometimes that's what we do with God. We expect God to allow us to just go back and forth from this world to Him and this world to Him and there's never really any change. And when we're apathetic, that's what happens. And you know why some Christians are the most unhappy people in the world? Because they know they're not truly dedicated to God and they feel guilty. And then they don't try to fight against the sin and they feel guilty. And eventually they give up. That's sad. And you may be sitting here today saying, you know what, I'm wholly dedicated to God. I'm drinking from Him. But I love going home in the evenings instead of opening up my Bible and studying it with my family. I just want to sit in my easy chair and watch TV. Oh, I like to worship when it's convenient and when I want to worship and when God can give me what I think He ought to give me, and it's great. But if it's a little inconvenient or I have to move things around my schedule to be a part of the congregation and support the work that they're doing, I just don't have time and don't want to do it. disgusting you may be 75-80% full of God 
and only 10 to 20 percent of the world. But at the end of the day, when God looks at that life, it's a disgusting mixture that we then expect God to receive and accept. Say, God, this ought to be good enough. 70% is passing. And if that's your approach to God, I want to tell you, you've missed the entire point. Because we offer this to God as a reasonable sacrifice. God, you'll receive this. You'll drink this. (coughs) And we expect God to be satisfied with that. Yeah, it's disgusting. (laughs) It is. But that's exactly what happens when we bring God a half-dedicated heart. This morning, are you apathetic toward the things of God? You may be sitting on a pew every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Sunday evening, but is your heart truly converted to Christ? You may be here this morning and you know you are caught up in sin and you know sin has a hold of your life, but for some reason you came here to this building this morning and you're really ready to dedicate yourself to God. Today's the day. And you may be saying, no, I'll do it later, or yeah, I need to do that, but I'm not ready. If you take that approach, you'll never be ready. You may be here this morning, and this may be perfectly indicative of your life. I'm a lot of good, but there's still some of the world in me. And I'm expecting God to be happy and content with that. If that's you, you need to be reconciled to God. And you need to pray to God that He would cleanse you wholly. That He would restore unto you the joy of His salvation and There's a couple of ways that we can help you with that this morning. The first is, if you've never been baptized into Christ, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You believe Jesus is the Son of God, you believe the gospel account of His death, burial, and resurrection, and you're willing to commit yourself to that type of life, being a disciple of His, not half-heartedly serving Him anymore, but in full self-sacrifice, doing what He's asked you to do, you can be buried with your Lord in baptism and have a new life today. If you're here and you've taken part in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ through baptism, but you know in your heart of hearts your life's not what it ought to be, I want to tell you, somebody else knows that too, and He's your God in heaven. And He's looking for you to come walking back to Him. He's looking to see a heart that will turn and and truly seek after His will again. And this morning, if you need to refocus and rededicate and get on fire for Christ again, we're going to give you that opportunity. Christ invites you to come. We believe in the restorative power of the blood of Christ and the forgiveness of sins, and you can have that this morning if you need it.